Good morning and welcome everybody to Designer's Way Christian Church. Yeah, good morning everybody. Mm. Oh man, we just had just an awesome, awesome, awesome worship experience. And, um, I, I, I have some announcements that I'm supposed to do, uh, but I really, uh, I want to follow the Spirit of God in this moment because I just, I really feel that the presence of God is just very, very heavy. Um, I began this series with, well, maybe not this series, perhaps it was watch night, but I shared something with you recently that my pastor went to the church of a very well-known pastor. If I were to say his name, everyone in this room would know who he was. And my pastor went to speak one Sunday at his church. When the Sunday was over, he said, my pastor said to this pastor, he said, you know, you have done a great job at really just cultivating an atmosphere here of the kingdom of God. And that gentleman very humbly said, yeah, it's, it's all God, it's all God. My pastor then said to him, God is everywhere, but not everywhere is like this. When the Lord shows up in a way that we are aware of, we have to recognize that he hasn't shown up everywhere like that. So when we experience a moment like the one we just experienced, we have to recognize that God didn't show up everywhere this morning like that. And I think that when the Lord visits in a, in a particular kind of way, um, that we have to be aware that he's in the process of doing something in that place in those moments. So I want to get right into our word, and I, I will, Shanetta, I will get to these announcements, I promise, perhaps at the end, if, if somebody reminds me, Mom, if you'll remind me. I want everybody, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 4. I'm not going to get to it right now, we'll get to it soon, uh, but I want you to have that text ready. Recognize for those of you who are first-time visitors, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, all of the scriptures will appear on the screens behind me. We'll be reading out of the New International Version of the Bible together. We don't read out of the NIV because it's uh, more holy or less holy than another version. We read out of the NIV simply because it's easy to understand. And indeed, if you're going to read God's Word, I trust that you're doing it for the purpose of understanding it. Um, if you have First Peter together, if you have it ready, say amen. 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 Uh, Father, we are aware of your presence. We are aware that though you are omnipresent everywhere, always, there are some moments and some places where your presence and power are heavier. And as we recognize that, Father, we respond in this moment, in this place, to that with a readiness of heart and a readiness of mind to be prepared to hear what you are saying. That God, in this moment, I pray that every eye that looks to this platform, whether they're in this building, whether they are with us online, live, I pray that every eye that looks on this platform looks past me, recognizes that I am nothing but a human servant just as imperfect as anyone else, not holier than anyone else, but that I am a servant whose job is to proclaim, to be a herald of the kingdom of God, to teach your truths, because as you are the creator and the designer of all life, you know how life works best. And so I pray in this moment as Jesus said to us that the Holy Spirit would reveal all truth. I pray that your Holy Spirit would visit every person sitting in every chair in this room. I pray that your Holy Spirit would visit every home of every person who's watching. 
and that your Holy Spirit would be the revealer and the confirmer of truth this morning. That as you use me as a tool to proclaim your word, that your Holy Spirit would bring confirmation, conviction, change, and challenge. And that as a result, that we, your people, would be sanctified. As you said, it was indeed your purpose that we would be conformed to the likeness of your Son. Humble us. Remove our pride in this moment. Remove the pride of our minds, the pride of our educations, the pride of our self-perceived wisdom. Remove the lies and the destructions, the distractions of this world from our minds and eyes this morning. And help us to see your truth with such clarity that we change. Thank you, Father, so much for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come in a little hot this morning. Um, yeah. There, there are three things that generally hinder and stand in the way of people ultimately fulfilling their divine purpose for their lives. I want to be clear, three things that generally hinder people from fulfilling their divine purpose for their lives. And when I say divine purpose, I want us to be clear about the fact that as we studied last week, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's, belongs to him, and the fullness thereof, everything in it, the world and all who dwell within. Everything that has been created belongs to the one who created it, and we are no exception. And so the first one of those things that tends to hinder people from divine purpose, divine purpose being the purpose for which God created you, because your birth was not an accident, in spite of how your parents may have said that it took place, the conception, that doesn't matter. Your birth was no accident. God was specific and intentional and was operating by the design that he put in place on the day or the night that you were conceived. And while you were in your mother's womb, God was moving, making you who you are. And he was fashioning you in the mold of which he intended to use you. Whatever his purpose was for you, this is how he fashioned you in your mother's womb. This first thing that tends to hinder us from fulfilling our divine purpose is pride. It is an inability, an unwillingness to recognize that God is the creator, and as a result, we are creatures. A creature is a man, it is the, it is the product of the creation of the creator. And we were created for a specific purpose, that purpose being to serve the one who created us. And it is generally pride that keeps us from admitting the fact that we're not here for our own intended purposes, but we are here for whatever it is that he desires of us. Pride. Um, the second thing that tends to hinder people from fulfilling their divine purpose is not recognizing the urgency of serving him. 
the urgency. Acts chapter 17, verses 30, 31, or 31, 32. It's the first passage I ever memorized. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he has given proof of this to all people by raising him from the dead. The important thing for us this morning to note in regard to that text is he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice. Please hear me. The world is on a clock. Yes, yes, amen. The world is on a timer. There is a day that God already has in his mind when he is going to end all things as we know it and proceed with his plan thereafter. Not recognizing the urgency puts us in a place where in our lives we don't recognize that we only have a short time in which to contribute to that plan. I say a short time because if you're in your 20s, you think you have forever, but if you're like me and you're in your 50s, 50 and over, you recognize time is moving like this. And that's your time in which you can participate in the urgency of this plan is not as long as most people think it is. Not only that, but since you only have your lifetime and your life is not that short, not that long, do you have time to not serve? I want you to consider this. Jesus kind of spoke about this in Matthew 24. I'm going to paraphrase it for you, but we'll put it on the screens. Matthew 24, 25. Here's what, here, here's what Jesus said. He says, you know, the faithful and the wise servant is the one who, when the master comes, is found doing his work. I want to ask you, being that the timer could go off next year, or that the timer could go off next month, or that the timer could go off next week, or that the timer could go off tonight. If it were to go off, would you be found serving him? What is your right now status? Would you be found serving him? Because see, Jesus is saying that the master is coming. And Jesus is saying the faithful and the wise servant will be found doing the work that the master has instructed him to do when he comes. If he were to come right now, could you say, as you look the creator of the universe in the face, in the hereafter, that, Lord, when you came, I was about your business. See, the misperception of urgency. Most people feel like serving is something, oh, I can do that later. I can give a little time to it, maybe. I'll think about it. Praying about where God wants me to serve. But it's urgent. This idea that God has overlooked such ignorance in the past, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. That's about urgency. Because the reason why God is so generous with his grace, meaning the reason why God gives you what you don't deserve, and the reason why he's so generous with his mercy, the reason why he doesn't give you what you do deserve, the reason why is because he's got a timer and he loves us, and he wants as many people as possible to come to know him through Jesus Christ as can come before that timer goes off. There's an urgency to our service. This last one, third reason, this is where we're going to spend our time today. The last one is a matter of misperception. It is believing that the primary purpose, please hear my words because I do structure them carefully. 
It is believing that the primary purpose of the church is to make your life better. It is the misperception that the primary, primary being the highest, or the top priority, that the primary purpose of the church is to make your life better as an individual, my life. I'm going to go to church because I need something. Now, better, now that term better, that is highly subjective. And it's got multiple angles and layers, right? You could desire to be emotionally better. You could desire to be financially better. You could desire to be physically better. You could, be, you could desire to be spiritually better. But the reality is for many of us, as we think about better, it just simply means what we desire. So we have a misconception about the purpose, primary purpose of the church, that it is indeed to make our lives better. Now, the challenge with this is there are some people who are not saved and who don't know God and who don't feel like they need to know God simply because the life they have right now, they don't see how it could be better. This is why Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because when you are ultimately wealthy, it's like, how could life be better? I have everything that everybody wants. It couldn't be better than this. However, this is not a perception that just strictly is reserved for those who are extremely wealthy. There are people who are just doing their lives pretty well, driving the cars they want to drive, living the houses they want to live. They're with who they want to be with. They've got everything that they are comfortable with, and they just don't simply see a need for life to be better. Therefore, church has no real it has no real place or purpose in their lives because they always view church as something that exists to make people's lives better. This is the premise behind the idea of Karl Marx's famous statement, religion is the opiate of the masses. Because from his perspective, religion just exists to help people feel better about their lives. <sighs> On the other side of that, we have those who are saved, who believe that church exists so to make their lives better. That the primary purpose of the church is to make their lives better. Some of those people will get up on Sunday morning and decide, well, I don't need it today. I'm doing all right in this season. <laughs> Some of them come to church and they come for what they can get to make them feel better. And certain segments of church culture have not helped. As we've preached about this God who's going to make all your dreams come true. As we've preached about this God who's going to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. I want to say this, and, and, I, and, I, and I want you to hear me carefully. I'm going to share with you the primary purpose of the church, but I need you to be real about this and understand this, recognize this clearly, that the primary, primary, the primary purpose of the church is not to make your life better. And it might be secondary, maybe tertiary, but not primary. And the challenge is, if we don't see church through the lens of God's desires and purposes, but rather our own, then we miss our purpose in the church. So I want to show you the primary purpose of the church. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. This is where it is. This is where the Lord speaks to us this morning, a truth that I hope will shake and jar you into a different place in regard to your service to him. First Peter chapter two, verse number four says this, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by 
God. We're talking about Jesus. And precious to him. He's saying that Jesus is precious to God. My question to you is, if Jesus is precious to God, shouldn't he also be precious to us? As you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones. This is just kind of a reverberation of a concept that the New Testament scriptures speak to us over and over again about the fact that we are in him. So if we are in him and he is the living stone, that makes us living stones. And the reality is that Peter is, is, he's using some figurative language to make a point because he refers to us as living stones. He does this because, number one, stones are used to build something. So something is being built. And the materials used to build this something is people who have come to Christ and are now in him. So it says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. This is what's being built. A spiritual house. It is this kind of New Testament phrasing from which we come to understand that the church is not these walls. Not the ceiling, this floor, or these chairs, but that the church is indeed those of you who are in this room and those of you who are watching online who are in Christ. You are the living stones in which this particular spiritual house is being built. And then he says, there's a reason for this. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house why? To be a holy priesthood. That word holy just simply means set apart. Priesthood means you are one of a group of priests. Priests exist to serve their God. And priests exist to serve their God with specific duties. Remember last week we were looking at that passage it was tough to take, especially if, especially if you're struggling with pride, where Jesus was saying, hey, if you had a servant who had been working outside all day and came in, would you say to him, hey, come sit down and eat with me? He said, no, you wouldn't do that. He's a servant. So you tell him, fix my food first and let me eat first. Then you can eat. <laughs> like, wow, Jesus, <laughs> it's kind of cold. Then he said, and then he said, would you thank that servant for doing their job? He said, no. Why would you thank a servant for doing what they're supposed to do? I, I thought it was tough when Jesus called that woman a dog. I mean, <laughs> then Jesus said, no, you wouldn't thank them for doing their duty. And then he said, so it is with you. If you do what I tell you to do, don't look for thanks or praise. Rather say we are unworthy servants just doing our duty. Oh, if there's any pride in you, woo, Jesus just, he just, do you know why Jesus can talk like that? Because all things were made in him. Through him, by him, for him. He can talk like that. And he's talking about us. If you have the humility to accept that, you can go far in your relationship with God. If you don't, there are going to be some bumps and bruises along the way because God, he resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Priests have duties. We have duties. We're living stones being used to build a spiritual house so that we could be a holy priesthood. 
perform our duties. Here's what he says next in the next part of this verse. Here are the duties. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He makes this point. He says spiritual sacrifices because he's drawing on the imagery of Old Testament and Old Covenant priests who would be sacrificing blood of the sacrificing goats and bulls or sacrificing some kind of produce. He says, no, see, this is a spiritual sacrifice. But his point is not that we are sacrificing things that are not tangible. His point is that what we sacrifice impacts something intangible. His point is that this is a spiritual that this is a, a spiritual sacrifice because these sacrifices that we make proclaim, serve, and expand an intangible kingdom. When Francisco asked the question last week about the kingdom of God, the fact that Jesus says, look, it's not here or there. In fact, it's in your midst. Or some passages say it's in you. It's about the fact that God's kingdom is not a kingdom that can be seen. However, it can still be proclaimed served and expanded even though it can't be seen and our spiritual sacrifices are how that's done what are these spiritual sacrifices look every time that you are able to be in a place where you serve him in some ministry capacity you are actively proclaiming serving and helping to expand this invisible kingdom. Every time you gather for corporate prayer, every time you do it in a powerful way, you proclaim and serve and expand this invisible kingdom. When you worship God, When you're able to lift your hands, when you're able to sing, when you're able to bow, when you're able to lay prostrate, however it is that you worship, but you're actively engaged in worship, when you do that, you are powerfully proclaiming, serving, and expanding the invisible kingdom of God. I remember when I was a young believer just coming into the Lord, I was one of those people, you probably heard this before, I was one of those people who was like, yes, I just need the word. I just, I just need the word. I, need, I don't need worship. I, like, I would get there late. I don't need worship. I just need the word. I thought that the fact, I thought that that was really, that shows some real maturity. I need the word, just the word. <laughs> but it didn't take me long to realize that I should never be in the presence of an omnipotent, omniscient king and not give him the worship that he's due. I was immature spiritually when I was against the the word. I I was immature spiritually. What's funny is I'm hoping that, I don't remember if, if this is the case, but I'm hoping if I said that to any old saint that in their mind they're not like, he's immature. He don't know. Yeah. Yeah, you, should, you should never be in the presence of the God of this universe and not be humble enough to praise your creator. And when we come together, our voices lifted, our hands lifted, standing before our God, we are powerfully proclaiming the dominion of an invisible kingdom, serving that kingdom and expanding it with our praise. These are the duties of a priest. Whenever we give, whenever we give, we we proclaim the dominion of this kingdom. Hear me on this. There are only two things that Jesus referred to in the New Testament scriptures 
as clear rivals to God. Two. One was the God of this world. Satan. I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily, if I necessarily like the name Satan, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's used, it describes the enemy. The other one was money. Do you remember when Jesus said, can you serve two masters? Can you so serve both money and God? Whenever you give, you are declaring that money is not your God. It has no hold over you. And this is one of the reasons you can give it freely. Now, I will say that is not the reason you give. I'm just saying to you that it proclaims that your allegiance is to your God. It serves. It is a form of service in that what you give allows for the kingdom of God in the earth as it does its work through the people of God to continue to do so in whatever fashion in which it does. And then lastly, it expands. I, was ex I, had lead I had meetings with the leadership yesterday. I had a meeting with them. We had a gathering. We had a, just an awesome time. We, ha we, we have awesome, listen, <laughs> We have awesome leaders. We have awesome, awesome, awesome leaders. Our ministry leaders are just, they are just tremendous, unbelievable people. But I was saying, I was saying to them yesterday, you know, when we started this church in the hotel and we moved from the hotel to what we affectionately call the Dirt Road Church, we, were, we had a little church in Tenota Sasa. It was on a private road it was a dirt road, and it was a nightmare to drive if you had a nice car. Like, if you had a nice car, you didn't want to drive on that. Now, wait, wait, it's a nice car. Nice car. If you had a nice car, you didn't want to drive on that. Those R's, it's some, some words I just can't. Look, <laughs> garbage is garbage. It's just what it is. Look, but if you had a nice car, you didn't want to drive on this because it was bad, and it was raining, it was mud, everything else. But I, but I was saying to them that when we moved from the hotel to the dirt road, we couldn't afford to be there. We didn't, we didn't have the tithes and offerings to make the monthly payment on that space. But we moved there anyway. And the Lord provided. When we moved from the dirt road to Harney Road, we couldn't afford to be there. <laughs> we couldn't afford it. We were short a few thousand dollars. But we moved there anyway. And the Lord provided. And when we moved from Harney Road to this place... We were several thousand dollars short a month. Couldn't afford it. But the Lord provided. But how did he do that? He did it through the obedience of those who were willing to do their duty in their giving. When we first leased this place, we leased 9,000 square feet. We now lease 14,000 square feet. So that during the time that we've been here, we've expanded this room. We took over this space next to us. We've done a number of different things. Why could we do that? Because the giving of priestly folks who were doing their duty and allowed for the kingdom of God to expand. Amen. Amen. See, I need you to recognize as the Holy Spirit is drawing us to this idea that his kingdom is only built by faithful links. It is recognizing that we are the living stones on which this spiritual house is being built and that we are building it so that we can be the royal priesthood for our God offering our spiritual sacrifices to and for his invisible kingdom. Listen to me. The kingdom of God may not exist at your job, but when you show up here, isn't it here? The kingdom of God may not exist, exist at your cousin's house, but when you come here, isn't it here? The kingdom of God may not exist at your gym. That's all right, but when you come here, 
doesn't the kingdom of God exist in this place? See, there are so many places outside of us where God's kingdom does not reign. But here, where his world's priests live, it reigns. And see, this call from God to us about being faithful links is about doing so so that ultimately he is glorified and that his purposes are fulfilled in and through us in our midst.